This video discusses the defending operators that I think give the most guaranteed value as of the meta in Operation Deadly Omen. Whether you're a new or more relatively experienced player, these operators will contribute to your lineup significantly in just about every situation that you come across. So let's talk top five defenders. This video is sponsored by Cook Unity. Cook Unity is a tailor designed home meal program specifically that delivers restaurant quality meals from award winning chefs straight to your door every week. I, of course, would encourage any viewers of the GGE to check them out. There's a lot of good stuff here for foodies, tons of variety. You basically pick a subscription plan, whether you're on a high protein kick, whether you're vegan or vegetarian, pescatarian, the meals are fully cooked. They ship out to you with a cooling like bag. It's like there's like gooey stuff in the packaging that keeps it cool. It's never frozen. You can get as little as four meals a week or you can get the whole smorgasbord. You can get up to 16 in a week. Skip, pause, cancel anytime. And you can go as low as $11 per meal. So if you're delivering food a lot, you obviously understand that that's pretty cheap comparatively. I'm usually not too big on microwave food, but the quality here, you can taste it. It's pretty solid stuff. It's pretty good. Kitchen's kind of a mess, warning. Living with four dudes, just kind of how it goes. I'm in the mood for some curry, let's give it a whirl. So because I'm a nerd, I do like putting it in the oven if you can help it, but you can also put it in the microwave. Looks pretty good. Nutritional information here with the QR code. These containers can actually cook in the oven. What you do for the oven is to take the film off. This is very good. This is, this is really good. Um, the flavor is robust. It has a lot of different things going on. There's an emphasis on flavorful, savory ingredients here. It's just good quality curry. It's just really, really good. What you would typically get from a restaurant, right? Like something cooked right there at the kitchen, except it comes in the mail. Like there's really not a lot to complain about. I do also appreciate the local sourcing of the meals. I'm always relatively confident that what I get is going to be as fresh as possible, especially here in San Antonio, which is kind of steak country. I do appreciate that quite a lot. Go to cookunity.com slash gregor50 or click the link in the description and use my code gregor50 to get 50% off of your first order of Cook Unity meals to try them out for yourself. All right, so Azami, I know she got nerfed. Uh, she's still one of the better characters, even after the nerf, which probably doesn't surprise a ton of people. It turns out most people don't want to dump an entire magazine to get rid of one barrier. That's still a resource that you are forcing the attackers to use, which is not insignificant. So the big thing about Azami, everybody's fairly familiar with it, or at least I assume they are by now. She constructs the map however she wants. She makes some parts of the building that were previously unplayable, playable again. Examples of where she's still useful include Clubhouse Garage Rafters, Bank Top Floor, and clubhouse bottom floor for the hatches. If they get hatch control, you can plug up the sight lines they would normally get. There's little pieces of the map terrain, the actual kind of kind of the, the ceiling there with the air vent and clubhouse in particular for the kitchen hatch. You can throw a couple of Kiba barriers and you're good to go. For bank top floor, a good example are the chandelier spots where she can plug up a lawn sight line that the attackers will try to cut off from repel. So anywhere where there's window play, lots of wide open access, cafe, top floor, uh, cafe, bottom floor, all those other maps that I just mentioned. There's really not a lot of situations where it's like, oh no, we have an Azami on the board. She's usually going to contribute something. Now, throwing a Kiba still means that the attacker has to expend some kind of resource. And even though you do have to contend with it, given certain circumstances. That's still resources. So shooting it leaves an operator vulnerable. It announces their presence. And dumping a whole 30 round mag doesn't happen instantly. The exception to this obviously includes DMRs, which take about, I believe it was 10 shots exact. I'm not 100% sure at the top of my head. I do know that you can take care of it in one mag. So at least 10 or 11. Uh, she works on a wide range of maps. She is a confident gunfighter. The 9x19 isn't a crazy weapon, but it's still pretty competent. And map manipulation of any kind is just going to be super helpful, especially in terms of sight setup. You can also run the ACS-12 if you like. That thing has an ACOG scope, which isn't too bad. Despite all these changes, 
right? Azami still has the highest operator presence rate when you stack ban and pick rate as of NAL 2024 stage one, which I also cross reference these charts whenever we're talking about operator statistics in general. So if you want to take a look at those, just look up Siege GG, and then you can find a number of different competitions where the operator pick rates are tallied. Next up, I have Fenrir. Fenrir still has the biggest quote unquote pain in the ass factor in the game. Now, listen, that's not an empirical metric. I understand that. But for the purpose of the video, we'll just go with it. So Fenrir forces crosshair deviation and he denies the ability for you to take a gunfight. So he is much stronger than Malusi in, in most contexts. There are some situations where I think a Malusi is nice to have. Also, Malusi gets an ACOG now on her MP5, which is pretty sick. Um, she's a really confident side anchor for that reason, in my opinion. But what makes Fenrir so frustrating is that you have to look for the mine. And while you're looking for the mine, you can't shoot the opponent. So with Malusi, you run into the effective CCing radius of the gadget. And then you can take the option of just keeping your gun up and taking the gunfight anyway. You can keep pushing up with your gun up. It's not great, right? It's not a tremendously advantageous situation and, and you'll end up having um, a loss of peeker's advantage, right? If you're caught out in the open, somebody can just swing off a cover, but you still have that option, right? You can still, if you really have to, keep the gun up to take the fight. With Fenrir, you can't do that. You're just, you're blinded. And what's different too with Malusi is that Fenrir can throw the mine anywhere he wants. Uh, unlike Malusi's, which are big and sit on flat surfaces. So he forces attackers to respond to the presence of his gadget. Forced response in reaction to gadget play is really, really important in this game in terms of making the character good or bad. If you can just ignore the gadget, it's like, okay, whatever. But Fenrir, you can't ignore the gadget. Malusis are also much bigger targets. So when you compare this with Fenrir's ability to throw the mines in cracks and crevices, little indentations in map terrain like sinks, shelving, etc., sometimes it can be a pain just to find the mine. And so you're stuck with this really, really awkward situation. You try to find the mine or you have to go somewhere else to take a gunfight. I've had a couple of instances like this where I would like to take a gunfight route this way, but I can't afford to look around and spend like, who knows, maybe 10 seconds at some points just looking for the stupid mine because it's like tucked underneath a little piece of furniture or something. Especially when you're under pressure, it's tough to do. So he's really good at applying pressure to enemies. He has respectable weapons on top of a Bailiff for site setup. So he's a very versatile flex character who you don't really need a reason to forego Fenrir in most cases. He works on a variety of sites. He can play passively or aggressively depending on, you want, on what you want to do. He's really good. All right, next up, Wamai. So we've come a long way uh, with Wamai. He is the premier grenade catch right now. I bet a lot of you didn't know that. Jaeger has actually taken a back seat due to the static kind of bunker style gameplay for defense. Not really being that popular anymore. Not really uh, being as viable. You need to be able to adapt to a wide variety of situations. You need to be able to adapt to where the enemy is going to go. And Wumai allows you to do that. Wumai provides versatile grenade catch that can be applied to any kind of scenario. So you have the throwing capability of the gadget that allows him to work grenade catch from just about anywhere safely too. He can throw it pretty far, so you can adjust to attacker rotations. If you're playing one site, you don't have to worry about running all the way to the other site. You can just throw the mine, or you can... Uh, it's not a mine. You understand what I mean. Uh, you can throw the frisbee, and you're good to go. So it's not like Jaeger, where it's set and forget. It has to be in a high traffic point. With the mine, you can afford to be a little more loosey-goosey with it. He's, he's much more flexible. Another cool thing about Wumai is that he catches Capital Bulls, whereas Jaeger ADSs do not. So this is not irrelevant on Clubhouse Rafters, my favorite site to talk about in this video, apparently, um, which we will also continue discussing. Um, yeah, so there's lots of situations where Capital is kind of needed in order to make the push a little bit less dangerous. 
and Wamai obviously counters that. He can throw my discs in tricky positions, too. He can mess with the enemy, which is... That's the fun way to play him. I, I personally enjoy playing him that way. So you can use ceilings, lampshades, uh, those, those lamps on border that kind of hang from the ceiling is a good example. Some of them are outside. People will often not look up because it's, you know, it's a, like a weird position to look for anything. No one usually looks there, right? It's kind of a blind spot. Uh, other sorts of random map terrain, crap, you know, that you can throw my discs in. You can get the attack to flashbang themselves, right, in the worst of situations. And you're not always going to capitalize on it for a kill, but maybe you can, right? At the very least, you're going to cause confusion, and you're going to mess with their communication and coordination enough for you to get a pick, which is a little bit more of an abstract concept. I know, you know, some people are going to think that's kind of a, a random point to throw out there but it but it's not irrelevant in my opinion um because how many rounds have you lost because comms are crappy so think about that if you can cause crappy comms you know this is you know we're talking like guerrilla warfare right in a, in a computer game but it's kind of the same concept so yeah his guns are solid he has an mp5k with an acog uh which is one of the better long range defense guns in my opinion uh, and he can plug and play into just about any kind of situation. He's only limited by the map terrain and your own personal map knowledge. All right, Cade. Cad, sorry. <laughs> He's just, like, he, he got really unlucky, man. He got really unlucky dealing with dumb Americans. So, Cade uh, is the premier wall denial operator. Uh, his denial is safe, right? He can throw it from a safe distance. And he can also trick under the right circumstances. His weapons are solid. He has a TCSG for site setup capabilities, which is always a plus. And he has an ACOG. So the gun hits like a truck, and he can also help his team. So that's really good. He has a three armor rating, and in this particular set of context, set of context, whatever. I'm not doing another take. Get over it. Uh, <laughs> it actually suits him really well, uh, considering he's going to be uh, playing within the bomb sites for the most part. He can afford to take a hit or two, and he can kind of peek off of cover and, you know, take a shot to the arm, take a shot to the leg, and he can still fight, which is really cool. So, yeah, it's one of those situations where it's like you're not going to be roaming with him, right? So, in this case, the armor is not really that much of a disadvantage, because he's already going to be in position to take a fight to begin with. He also has C4. That's big, right? Any kind of sight anchor with C4, big, big, big. He can also deny hatches so that's one of the things right the verticality aspect right being able to throw the electric denial that's really what it is right there's no other operator in the game that can do that it sounds like kind of basic duh like you know we already know this like why are we spending time talking about this when we're comparing it to other characters it's you know it's important to contextualize it right that but that is the truth the truth is he can deny hatches he can throw it and that's <laughs> that's a huge difference right um he can also get tricky with the placements for the claws they can be used in a variety of creative uh, creative positions one of the reasons why cali for instance right is so difficult to justify bringing in a lot of situations is because depending on how Cade throws the Cade stick cali can't do anything right the the lance won't go through the map terrain so for clubhouse cc great example uh you throw the Cade claw on the numbers right on the rafters is what it's called so you can deny the garage walls, and that's a supplementary sort of electric denial, whereas Mute can get the main. If he's the only wall denial, he can throw the claws on the outside of the wall itself, like underneath that little rafter ledge, and the brick wall door mold to the left of the main CC wall. So, in terms of operator presence, when you're accounting for bands and pick rate, again, uh, referencing the, uh, the chart that I mentioned at the beginning of the video, he has a presence rating of just about 60%. Though that's not actually picked very much uh, in the grand scheme of things because his ban rate is so high. So his presence rating is high, but his pick rate isn't in competitive. In ranked, uh, ban rates aren't thought about nearly as much, right? They're not as critical. So you can play to your advantage on that. If you want to be the wall denial guy, get good at Cade. It'll help you be a better player. All right. You're probably not going to be shocked by this one. I've saved the best for last. Solus. Uh, we've been talking about Solus for a year. She's busted. She can deny just about every drone in the prep phase. Uh, we're pretty much just going to reiterate stuff we already talked about in previous videos. But, it, like, 
There's not a lot that's changed, right? Um, her presence alone forces attackers to be much more careful with their drone placement, so she also has abstract value, right? Like non-tangible value. Being able to influence player behavior is something that other characters don't really get to do as much. Uh, Solus does that in spades. Yeah, like the rest of her kit is cool. Um, you know, she can she can find Lion, Finca, whenever they use their gadgets. Like, that's all actually, like, really nice, too. Like, don't get me wrong. Especially, uh, Jackal, right? So other characters that are gonna roam clear her, and the fact that she can counter them, plays into this a lot. So, she has the ability to take down drones, which is already good. Then she also counters her own roam clear very effectively. Because when she gets on the scanner, she can find Lion, she can find, uh, when Jackal's gonna scan her the only like main difference in terms of the roam clear countering is Dekebi because Dekebi doesn't have a telegraph when she uses the uh, when she uses her phone call right she doesn't announce that she's gonna call uh Solus has good primary and secondary weapons she gets an smg 11 which is fun to pair up with the shotgun right you get the verticality play of the shotgun if you want to use that i personally like using it and you can get free picks on unaware people outside, uh, like me, right? I, I always seem to be the person who forgets that there's a Solus on the board. So if that wasn't enough to be able to deny information, she can also do that. So she has to be cleared manually by a forced roam clear, like with a Doak or a Lion. And when you play her correctly, she's difficult to spot. She's going to spend a lot of time hiding from the info game. So she can't be cleared as efficiently... And to top it off, she can play Verticality for Plant Deny. So you can't clear her as easily as other characters. And then she can go below, right? She doesn't have to play the map game the same way. So she can play with less map control and deny Plant. So you can't clear her and she'll be below for Plant Deny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, she is a massive pain in the butt. Um, she's pretty much completely changed the way that you approach the info game. Solus also stacks with other characters very well, right? If you're trying to go for like full info deny, you can get a mute, you can get a mozzie. Huge, huge, huge pain in the butt. Huge pain in the butt to deal with. Bring a Solus, bring a mute on the site, bring another, bring a mozzie, and you've just, you, you have so much info deny, which attackers really need in this game, right? Because it's a defender sided game. So something's gonna happen to her. In year nine, they announced it. Ubisoft announced it in their roadmap. Um, I hope, you know, I think it's going to be useful, right? It, sh it needs to be done because she's very powerful right now. And that's my top five defenders for Operation Deadly Omen. If this video gave you any useful information, be sure to like and subscribe for more like it. Also check out my top five attackers. And I will see you all in the next video. Take care. Thanks for watching. Deuces.